Hi everyone, uh, Anthony Goldblum, CEO of Kaggle. Um, we started uh, almost nine years ago actually in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, we started out running machine learning competitions and now um, uh, we actually um, do, do a bit more than that. We also have a hosted notebook environment uh, called Kaggle Kernels. Um, we have a, uh, I kind of describe it as a YouTube for data sets, like a, a place where people can share data sets with each other. Um, so we have a uh, four, 14,000, uh, four, well maybe 14,500 publicly shared data sets. Um, and we have Kaggle Learn, which is um, a very short form data science education that helps people get started uh, uh, in their data science journey and then ultimately can tackle whether it be competitions uh, or uh, projects on Kaggle data sets. Um, so yeah, that's me, Meg. Hi, I'm Megan Rizdahl. Um, I'm a product lead at Kaggle. Um, I've been with Kaggle for about three years now and I've had um, a great opportunity to work really closely with the community. Um, also work on the data sets product um, and uh, some of the integrations that we're building with um, Google Cloud Platform. Um, yeah, that's me. Can you see a question to me? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, okay, I can come out and read it. So what, the first one is, why did you start Kaggle? Why? Um, so initially, um, <laughs> I was just telling the story to somebody outside. Uh, I was a statistician by training or an econometrician, and uh, I used to work on um, forecasting things like uh, GDP, inflation, unemployment, and it was fairly frustrating. Uh, GDP, you get a new observation once every quarter. Uh, it's not really clear that it actually uh, is a particularly meaningful observation, like it's, a, it's this composite metric that um, at best is a very noisy indicator of economic activity. Um, and you have structural breaks, so it's almost a nightmare. It's, it's actually not clear that you can forecast GDP uh, with any degree of accuracy. So, it's, so I love the techniques of uh, data science, statistics, um, econometri econometrics, and love the idea um, that there was interesting insights and interesting things to pull out of data sets, but was always uh, was fairly frustrated, I guess, with the data sets that, that I was working on. And so the idea behind Kaggle was um, to give people like me access to more interesting real world data sets and companies access to people like me. Um, a couple of ironies, I've almost hardly competed in a Kaggle competition. Uh, so, um, um, uh, and the second irony is uh, I've discovered that I wouldn't actually be very good if I did. I think we have some of the uh, very elite uh, sitting in the front row and we'll hear from shortly. Um, uh, but yeah, that was the initial trigger behind Kaggle. I'd say that um, since then we've grown into these other areas and um, I think with every level of success, so we became quite successful with the machine learning competitions, but um, you, you, at each level of success you, you uh, become more ambitious and uh, we wanted to serve more and more data scientists and be a bigger part of data scientists' lives and um, we saw some areas with Kaggle kernels and data sets and, and Kaggle Learn where we could expand and, and uh, have a bigger impact on the data science community. Thank you. So the next one is about um, what's the future of competitions? So what do you see in the future for Kaggle and how different it will do in the, in the next couple of years? Mm. Should I take that? Yeah. So um, uh, if you look at um, the history of our machine learning competitions, initially when we started, it was mostly structured data uh, competitions. Uh, so you'd use feature engineering and something like random forest or gradient boosting machines. Um, then the deep neural network revolution uh, happened and a uh, common complaint from our community is too many image recognition problems. Um, 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 but that's where a lot of the um, excitement has been recently uh, and so um, we've had a higher proportion of image recognition problems and now also some of the new areas, you know, some of the other areas like natural language processing and um, would like to do more with audio data. Um, but really Kaggle wants to um, um, keep moving to where the, um, uh, we want to be somewhere between uh, where the cutting edge of academia is and where, uh, where you know, the, the g general industry is. Um, and so some of the, the exciting areas or the areas that um, ML researchers are excited about are areas like general adversarial networks, um, reinforcement learning. And so we're starting to look at running competitions in some of these newer areas. Um, the other um, uh, thing that we're uh, looking at with competitions is uh, we have this, as I mentioned, this hosted notebook environment called Kaggle Kernels. Um, and that, um, by running competitions in Kaggle Kernels, uh, it also gives us a lot more flexibility. 
Uh, so um, we can do things like have better support for time series competitions. We can uh, um, run competitions with constrained compute. Um, so there are some uh, issues we still need to figure out with making uh, competitions running Kaggle kernels a really good experience, but that's a big focus for us. Um, and uh, you know, as we start to improve that experience, we also expect a high proportion of our competitions to be run in Kaggle kernels. Great, thank you. So can you tell us a bit more about the motivations behind uh, the Kaggle kernels and the data set? So these are the two great products that are used regularly to demonstrate the data science. So what's, what's the motivations behind those two products? I do Kaggle kernels and you do data sets. Does sounds, that sound good? Sounds good. Um, so, well, actually, I'll give you a little bit of history. So uh, between 2010 and 2015, um, uh, we wanted to expand beyond competitions, but we were completely unsuccessful in doing it. Um, and one of the reasons we were unsuccessful is because we used to do things that we thought were a good idea as opposed to things that we actually saw demand for in the community. Um, so I'll give you a tangible example of this. One thing we uh, 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 realized um, one, thing, one thing that we thought was a great idea is um, you know, uh, our competitions were giving us a really good sense for what kind of techniques really work. And so maybe we'd start like a, a wiki where it would be like the wiki of machine learning. The field's moving very fast and this would be like, you know, rather than a textbook which is out of date within six months, this would be like a live textbook where you'd always come for the state of the art. It completely failed. Uh, and, and the reason it completely failed is we saw absolutely no sign of demand. We just thought it was a good idea. Uh, um, um, Kaggle kernels, um, one of the thing, uh, we, one of the main reasons uh, people come to Kaggle is to learn, and, and I guess you know uh, later as, as people get more advanced to get credentialed. Um, but um, the forums were incredibly active, and people were sharing lots and lots and lots of um, uh, you know t tips and ideas and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the forums were very vibrant. Um, one thing that was always sad, though, is when people tried to share code in the forums, those threads would always die. Uh, and the reason being is, you know, you want to get somebody else's code running where you need the same version of Python, the same libraries installed, the same data attached. And uh, it was a huge amount of work just to get somebody else's code running. Um, and so Kaggle Kernel started as a text box with a run button. Um, and, uh, and even as a text box with a run button, um, it was getting some amount of usage. Um, it was actually a bit of a controversial feature, but that's another story uh, for, another, for uh, for what it did to the competitive still dynamic. Controversial. Yeah, well, <laughs> less controversial. But yes, it still is somewhat controversial. Um, um, but it massively increased the amount of code sharing. And so what we had seen was we had seen um, uh, we had seen uh, uh, people trying to share code unsuccessfully in the forums, and that was a that was a usage pattern that gave us a sense that Kaggle kernels would be uh, interesting. Uh, do you want me to lead into data sets, or do you want to take it? Yeah, I can take it because yeah. you know data sets is a really similar story where um, you know if if you think about like competitions, it is also a, in a sense a data sets platform, and um, it was you know making data that you know as Anthony mentioned was otherwise really difficult for um, just amateur data scientists or people looking to kind of like break into the field, um, for them to get their hands on without being part of a large company like Walmart or Facebook or something. Um, so we exposed these really cool data sets where you could do, um, uh, and you could actually like work with them, you know, in kernels once we launched uh, the kernels product. Um, uh, but, you know, they're sort of like locked down. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, we also saw, you know, there's probably a huge amount of potential in um, just making more public data available sort of in one single place. Um, and that's what we're doing with the datasets platform. And sort of like what I what excites me about the, the datasets platform is the integration with kernels where um, when you publish a data set on Kaggle, um, you get the community writing code on it that um, you know is just sort of like a, a, a wellspring for uh, new ideas, reproducible um, ideas, um, and you've got discussions where people can talk about um, the data sets that are published. And this is in really stark contrast to a lot of other public data that you can find out, um, find out in, you know, on the internet. Um, so say um, government, government data, um, weather data from NOAA, you know, everybody's going to the same FTP server, they're downloading the same, like, weird um, delimited files, they have to use some like arcane like Fortran code to, to work with it. Um, whereas once you know that data set is on, on Kaggle, it's a really commonly used data set in a lot of different fields. Um, you know, they can find the code that helps them get started with it much faster. Um, 
and, and anything they, to add to yeah, that? Yeah, one thing to add is uh, uh, just on the, the usage pattern that made us think that data sets would be uh, powerful is um, we would share these competition data sets and we launched you know, three competitions a, a month and people would be sharing just random analysis uh, on those data sets. So one of my favorite, this actually from a recent competition is we hosted a competition, you know the, the Google Doodle thing where you, it says draw an alligator and you try and draw an alligator quickly. And, um, uh, we hosted a competition to take those um, drawings and figure out what, what, what those drawings try and classify them. And we saw people do things like figuring out whether people of different countries tend to draw their circles clockwise or counterclockwise. And this has absolutely nothing to do with the competition, right? It's just like a cool, interesting analysis that uh, people were doing. And that gave us a sense, you know, it's sort of fr frustrating, right, that we only launched three data sets uh, per, mm -hmm. per uh, month with the, the competitions. And there was obviously demand uh, to do much more. And that gave us a sense for, um, um, yeah, that there would be demand for data sets. And we should probably talk about Learn as well. Sure. You want to take it? Um, I don't know if I know well, you that. Well, you were a big contributor. Um, Meg wrote one of the most popular kernels oh, ever, and it was, yeah. a, it was a tutorial on, um, uh, on the Titanic competition. And just more generally, we noticed that the tutorials were the most right. upvoted uh, kernels, and that gave us a sense that there was um, demand for learning material, and that's where Kaggle Learn came from. Thank you. So the next one is uh, for people who want to become a better data scientist, uh, including myself. So we know that today we can enter uh, cargo competitions to learn about data science, but there are still some gaps between the, being a data scientist and cargo. So what are well, your, your advice to people who want to become a better data scientist? So there are some gaps, right? Is there any advice? Um, let's see. Um, I really like um, Walter Reed, or Inversion, as some of you may know him. Um, he had some really, really good advice that I think maybe he's shared on forums and blog posts and interviews that, um, that he's done. Um, and this is only one of sort of like many gaps to fill um, if all you do is compete on Kaggle. Um, is sort of like, uh, like actually writing down like what's your plan in competing on a competition, like what's your objective. Um, and sort of like writing like a narrative around like how you've iterated, um, like each iteration that you've done to sort of like improve your score, um, sort of like uh, putting some of like the narrative and putting into practice some of like the communication skills that are, um, an, I think like an often overlooked um, skill for data scientists. So a lot of people sort of like um, may want to focus on, uh, you know, I need to learn this particular algorithm or I need to learn such and such kind of like technical aspect, but um, I think the communication aspect um, and then, you know, out of that, you can write sort of like a blog post, you can create, um, you know, these like, you know, public artifacts that sort of show the world, like, here are my competen competencies in data science. And um, I think that's sort of like another kind of like a, yeah, really valuable place to, or a place to spend time if you're looking to develop sort of well-rounded uh, skills at, as a data scientist. Thank you. And that was exactly how I got into H2O, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> So the next I think one is actually uh, inversion. Who Meg uh, referenced is the only grandmaster we have hired that uh, H that H two O didn't get to first. <laughs> okay. The, the next one is: uh, Don't you think Cargo has misrepresented the real world problems because the data uh, on Cargo is always clean, but the real world one uh, never clean? So what do you think about this? Uh, I'm happy to take a go. So um, I would say that a machine learning competition um, probably covers maybe somewhere in the order of 50 to 60 percent of, uh, or maybe let's say 50 percent of what's important um, as a um, as a uh, as a data scientist. Um, one of the most important, most challenging things is is taking a business problem and converting it into a problem that uh, data science can solve, and that is not something uh, uh, that you directly learn how to do by competing in a competition. Um, that being said, by competing in enough competitions, you actually get to see what a problem looks like. That is, uh, like you get to see the output of a process of defining a, a business question um, um, as a machine learning question. And uh, that actually, I, I think, is more helpful than, uh, uh, than you might realize in uh, uh, in helping to frame um, a machine learning problem or take a business problem um, and and, uh, and uh, turn it into a machine learning problem. So I actually 
although it's not something that you directly do uh, as part of competing in a Kaggle competition, I do think it actually helps. Um, and then on the flip side, um, the other thing that you don't, this isn't implied by the question, but the other thing that you don't uh, ever do as part of a, a machine learning competition is uh, put a model into production, um, set up monitoring that model for that model, um, and that's a that's a meaningful chunk of work as well. You know, my hope is that that actually becomes at the moment it's really painful. Um, um, my uh, hope is that over the next few years that becomes simpler and simpler. As uh, you know, I think of data science, machine learning tooling as where software engineering tooling was 15 years ago. Right, we're in a pretty early stage. Um, and so my hope is that actually uh, the latter part ends up having to be less of a hardship than it currently is now. Um, and so that, you know, in a, in a, once that's the case, that actually I'll be able to say that a Kaggle competition teaches you 70% of what you need to know uh, to be an effective machine learner or data scientist. Great. By the way, can everyone hear us at the back? Are we speaking loud enough? Yeah. Okay. okay. So the next one is, um, don't you think Kaggle should focus on the underlying problems, so help data scientists to focus on the underlying problems instead of just asking them to fit X features um, to, the, to the output right? Um, I think this is like somewhat related to the previous question and Anthony's answer. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we started um, experimenting with doing what we're calling analytics competitions now. Um, it started as um, our data science for good program, I think that we launched maybe like a, a year or so ago. Um, so we've done uh, a few sort of like challenges on our data sets platform, kind of experimenting with this format, posing more open-ended um, uh, business problems applied to social good problems. Uh, and that has been really popular, um, at least from my standpoint, uh, it's, it seems like it's been really popular. So um, now we're kind of experimenting with um, taking that format to the competitions platform. Um, yeah, we, I would yeah love to hear any kind of like feedback uh, after this on how people are finding those. But um, the most recent example would be the um, NFL punt analytics competition. And the winners presented the day before the Super Bowl, which is exciting in yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So. Uh, so any thoughts on hosting academia benchmark? Um. Yeah, um, there's certainly um, an opportunity for us to, um, there are all these academic competitions and they set up these one-time um, environments, um, which is not a particularly good use of r resources when we have a, um, an environment that um, functions pretty nicely. There are some limitations of the Kaggle platform. One is that at the moment it's fairly difficult to get custom metrics in um, and academics often want um, pretty, well, very custom metrics uh, is what we found. And one of the reasons for this is ac academia is pushing their cutting edge and so experimenting with interesting metrics, et cetera, is often part of what makes an ap academic benchmark interesting. Um, we are currently working on uh, uh, redoing the way our metrics code works, and that will allow us to more easily um, allow um, our users to, or our customers to put in custom metrics. And so one direction that we're thinking about going is um, having more of a self-service uh, kind of a platform where, or s sorry, a self-service option for competition hosts where they can set up their own competition. If we haven't vetted it or had a hand in setting it up, we will not give um, points for the competition, but at least then we're um, um, kind of reducing the need for every single you know, academic benchmark to have to set up their own environment. I mean, I think some will choose to. Um, We've certainly hit some resistance as a result of being a commercial uh, company uh, that some academics don't like uh, reliance on a commercial company. So I don't think all academic benchmarks will end up on Kaggle, but uh, it will ha having that self-service option with the ability to put in custom metrics, I think, will will help. Okay, just one more question. So uh, this is like, a, would you ever hire someone at Kaggle based on just on their profile, the Kaggle profile? Yeah, we do. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I started on Kaggle. Yeah. <laughs> the only problem is H2O tends to get to them first. <laughs> so on that note, thanks again, Anthony and Megan. Thank you very much. Thank you.